Uh, thanks for coming along for our uh, DMRC research event. Uh, so you may recall that in the, um, in the deep um, past, before COVID, we used to have DMRC Fridays. And uh, these were centre-wide sort of research events where uh, people would come along and um, present their research to the community. And uh, we we did a couple of things like that during uh, the darkest days of the pandemic, but we never really had the opportunity to get back together to um, do this as a as a as a live kind of presentation. So this is the first one of these that we've been able to do for a while. Um, before I go any further, um, I'd like to begin by um, acknowledging the traditional owners. Uh, QUT acknowledges the Chiraba and Yagara as the First Nations owners of the lands where QUT now stands, and we pay respect to their elders, laws, customs and creation spirits. We recognise that these lands have always been places of teaching, research and learning, and acknowledge the important role Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people continue to play in the QUT community. Um, so I think I know most people online and most people in the room here, but if, um, if, if not, then uh, my name's Michael Dejuani. I'm the acting director of the Digital Media Research Centre. Um, usually the, um, and, and simultaneously at the moment, head of the um, Digital Inclusion and Participation Program in the centre. Um, and I'll be acting in this role for another, I think, three weeks or so until Patrick gets back. Um, and I'll be uh, very grateful to um, welcome him back to, to be director. Um, so, um, so thank you all for coming along, as I said. And so we're having two of these centre-wide research events this year, this one that we're having today, and we'll have another one later in the year. But in the mix of events and presentations for the DMRC this year, we also um, will be having a visiting scholar lecture um, in uh, August, and we'll release details about that in the coming weeks. We're just finalising plans for that, and but um, looks like we'll have uh, quite an exciting visiting scholar with us um, to spend some time with us, but also to do a presentation for us. And then also um, in October, we are going to have um, a DMRC showcase series of events, and that showcase um, will have at least two really significant events, or actually three really significant events. So uh, there'll probably be some sort of industry-facing event. Uh, we will um, uh, again this year have our Indigenous Re Research Seminar that will be part of that week, and we'll also have a public-facing event. And uh, we have um, secured Flow State at South Bank, which is kind of a, a semi-open uh, venue at um, South Bank that kind of faces onto, um, um, well, it faces onto South Bank itself and, and it, you know, it allows us to really engage with the public. So we hope we'll be able to do something really exciting in that venue. And uh, the committee that's um, organising all of that um, is meeting on a regular basis at the moment. And so we'll have more details about what that week will look like as well later in the year. Um, so, but without any further ado, I'd like to introduce this event today. And so today uh, we've got two presentations on the, on the topic of the digital town square. We, for this event, we did do something different in that we came up with a topic and then invited people to kind of speak to the topic. And um, which I think is a great idea. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll keep playing around with exactly how we do this in, in future, for future events. Um, um, so, you know, I guess it's coming up with the actual topic is always the challenge. And, um, and we might, you know, come back to the community as well to think about how we come up with, with the topics that we might want people to speak to. But in this case, it's a digital town square and we've got two, two talks. One is from smart cities to digital town squares data care as a model for community-led urban analysis. And so uh, we will have um, three people speaking as part of that, uh, Professor Peter Mitchell, Associate Professor Marcus Rittenbrock, and Professor um, Marcus Fott. And then in the second part, uh, we will have 
um, Amy Horrigan, who's a PhD candidate here in the DMRC, speaking on the I as we in the digital public sphere, socio-political reflections from Samoa. Um, so I'm going to, uh, so we will take questions at the end of each of the talks, um, and then we might open up to a more general discussion at the end as well. Um, but I'll hand over now to, I think, Peter, who is going to um, kick us off and, um, for our first talk. Thanks, Michael. I also need Marcus and Marcus. Oh, there they are. Great <laughs> to move the slides along. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Marcus. Great. Um, so before we begin, um, we'd also like to acknowledge the Turrbal and Yogura as the First Nations owners of the lands we're speaking to you from, uh, to pay respect to their elders, laws, customs and creation spirits, and to recognise that sovereignty was never ceded. Um, so today, as Michael has said, we'll be talking about this session's theme of the digital town square in the context of the smart city. Uh, I'm sorry I can't be there in person, as you might be able to hear. I'm not quite fit to be co-located with other humans at this point, but I'm coming to you from QT's own sort of digital town square here. I tried to get a backdrop that, that fit. Uh, so there'll be three of us uh, talking today, as Michael said, uh, and we'll each be covering one section of the talk. So I'll be talking first about what even is the digital town square in this context. Uh, then Marcus Rittenbrook will be talking about participatory data analytics as a way of reconfiguring a notion of the digital town square. And then Marcus Ford will be outlining data care, a project we're developing as a model for community-led urban analysis. So next slide, thanks Marcus. Great. So this is who we are. We're part of the Urban Media and Digital Geographies Research Group of the DMRC. We're an interdisciplinary group uh, bridging design and communication, as you can see. Uh, and you can find out more about us and the work our group does on the DMRC site. And we're really happy to talk to anyone after this session if you're interested in knowing more um, or getting involved. Next slide. Thanks, Marcus. Um, so we know uh, that the theme for today's uh, DMRC event uh, came from one of Elon Musk's pronouncements about Twitter and what he thinks it is and what he wants it to be. Uh, so in April, along with saying that he wanted to uh, authenticate all humans, Musk also announced that his vision for Twitter was as the Internet's digital town square where matters vital to humanity are debated. Uh, so next slide. Thanks, Marcus. And our own illustrious Jean Burgess even wrote a timely piece on this for the conversation the following day, I think, asking what it means for the idea of a digital town, digital town square when online spaces are owned by billionaires. Uh, next slide. Thanks, Marcus. Great. And here's a quote from Jean's article. She says, some critics think we should get rid of this idea of the digital town square altogether, but she argues that there's the possibility to consider this concept of digital town squares in a richer and more optimistic way, and that early Twitter was a pretty good, she says, if flawed example of this. Next slide. Thanks, Marcus. So what I want to do... Um, quickly now is give a very brief and cursory kind of genealogy of this digital town square concept to show how Musk was tapping into a very pervasive metaphor of the town square, a cliche really, but one that has very deep historical roots that bring together notions of public space, public space in, in a physical material sense, um, discourse space, virtual space and democratic space uh, that have underpinned visions of urban planning and the internet Internet alike. Uh, so in his, <coughs> essay, in his seminal essay on spaces of democracy from 1998, Richard Sennett looks back to ancient Greece to examine um, these two kinds of uh, these uh, two kinds of archetypal spaces of democracy, the theater and the agora or public square. And Senate explains how democracy in Athens was framed around or located in these two physical spaces, which were situated um, physically very close to one another. 
So the Pinnock's Theatre, where popular assemblies were held to debate public policy, overlooked the Agora, where, uh, which was also a public assembly and discourse space and also a commercial marketplace. And Senate says that what made the Agora different uh, from the theatre was the way that it forced the public to confront and engage with difference. Uh, it prepared, he said, people for diversity and for debate. So the Agora was a space of democracy and a space for encountering diversity, but of course, as Senate acknowledges, it was also a space of exclusion with women, slaves and other marginalized groups being largely excluded from it. And as Don Mitchell in The Right to the City has argued along with many other researchers, the Agora and public space in general is effectively underwritten by a politics of exclusion as well as symbolic and physical violence. So next slide, thanks. Marcus, great. Um, where we see this notion of the democratic potentialities of physical material, public space and discourse space coming together is, of course, in Habermas, who at the very outset of his uh, structural transformation of the public sphere invokes the agora as the kind of genesis point for the notion of a distinct um, public and private sphere. And he importantly points out that the agora was, was where public um, life played out. It was the most prominent place, but it wasn't the only place. Public life he said, was also constituted in discussion or lexis and in common action or praxis. And so here we get very strongly this interplay or even transfer from physical space to discourse space as a space of democratic engagement. And this, of course, was foundational in early discussions and debates about the internet and the potential for virtual spaces to operate as or to replicate both these democratic, physical and discursive spaces. Just one example here is Mark Post's 1997 essay on cyber democracy, where he invokes both the Habermasian public sphere and the Agora, um, saying that conceiving of the internet as a public sphere means taking very seriously these underpinning constitutive spatial metaphors. Metaphors. And it wasn't just researchers invoking um, these metaphors. GeoCities is a great example of this drive to kind of replicate a notion of democratizing urban space on the on the early internet. Those of you who, who can remember back to the mid 90s, um, GeoCities was this sort of spatially ordered web directory. So education and philosophy could be found under Athens. Uh, and there was an agora section as well. So it also very strongly invoked this kind of classical notion of, democ of democratic uh, space and places, excuse me. Next slide, thanks, Marcus. <clears throat> So Alessandro Origi's book, Making the Digital City, The Early Shaping of Urban Internet Space, is a fantastic exploration of how the early internet invoked physical public space in virtual environments and how important this idea or metaphor of the digital town square was. And just one example here that he gives is Barclay Bank's Barclay Square Virtual Marketplace and Shopping Mall, which was launched in, in 1995. Um, so if, if gone through all of this ancient history and ancient internet history uh, to highlight that Musk's invocation of this digital public square is both deeply rooted in early visions of the internet, um, but also in much earlier ideas about how public space might or might not facilitate democratic debate, engagement and deliberation. Next slide, please, Marcus. Um, but now I want to turn this around and set the scene for Marcus and Marcus's uh, part of the presentation to see not, um, not how urban or public space figures in the digital, how it might be replicated in these kind of virtual online spaces, but how physical urban public space is increasingly reconfigured by the digital and what this means for the idea of the digital town square. Uh, so you can see here on this, slide, on this slide this kind of shift I'm talking about from the idea of virtual cities to platform urbanism. And the image I have up here is of the failed Sidewalk Lab Toronto project. So announced in 2017, it was to be the ultimate kind of smart city built by Google's parent company Alphabet from the ground up. So it was this kind of first, you know, smart city from the ground up. The next slide, please, Marcus. It was also a perfect example of what Sarah Barnes has talked about as a drive towards platform urbanism that underpins contemporary smart city endeavours. Um, there have, of course, been trenchant critiques of this drive um, towards platform urbanism as encapsulated in the title of Shannon Matthorn's recent book, A City is Not a Computer. 
The Sidewalk Lab Toronto project was um, ultimately shelved a couple of years ago for a variety of reasons, not least of all because it failed to gain the trust of Toronto's citizens. So if you're interested in this story, you can read the article um, Marcus and I wrote with Monique Mann, uh, which examined the issues that smart cities and platform urbanism bring in terms of datafication and surveillance, uh, citizen trust, technological sovereignty, and the notion of private and public in the context of citizens and their data. Next slide. Thanks, Marcus. So an emergent and greatly hyped um, area in terms of smart city development, and the last one I'm going to talk about is digital twins. So this idea of creating a virtual twin of an urban environment that can then be used for things like simulation modeling. It's kind of the ultimate kind of um, the ultimate dream of the real time smart city, a city, a city built of and on data. And it, of course, raises concerns about use of citizen data and, and data sovereignty once you start trying to create virtual citizens using citizens citizen data within these digital twins it raises all new kinds of issues and concerns uh last slide from me thanks marcus next one so my final question before handing over to Marcus is that in an environment like this, um, within platform urbanism, smart cities, digital twins, where is the digital town square and what might it look like? Over to you, Marcus. Thank you very much, Peter. Okay, so I want to move on from, from the notion uh, of the digital town square to look at specifically the role that, that people can play in the smart city. So um, as Peter outlined, sort of in a, in a digital twin sort of scenario, this is a common scenario where we have um, city administration go hand in hand with the control of big data. <coughs> so rooms that have a lot of information coming in where people make decisions uh, around sort of smart city systems. But what we're interested in is to see what does the smart city mean for people from, from the perspective of ordinary citizens. Uh, so on the one hand, we have technological developments that actually enable us to engage people in some way that wasn't possible before. We have large data visualization screens, for instance, the, the cube that we had for a long time. Um, I was involved in, in the cube in the, in the early days, and we actually built a system that allowed people to, to project content, their own content on the cube. So that was, uh, so that, that was an early attempt to actually not just have curated content, but have people sort of share content on a platform that's largely public and visible. But, but how do we actually sort of use infrastructure like that? And who are the type of people that might want to sort of engage with data in the city? And here's a great example um, for something that's, that's popular across many cities, including Brisbane, which are food trucks. So food trucks are operated by small vendors that are sole traders who sort of have to find an audience and have to sort of really sort of understand where events are, what's a, what's, a, what's a good place to be at a certain time. And what the support, what sort of support would a food truck vendor actually need? What sort of data would they need? So one thing that we've done is actually uh, conduct a study through a PhD project uh, with, a, uh, with our PhD student, Daniel Filonik, that Marcus and I co-supervised a few years back, looking specifically at the mechanics of participatory data visualization. How can we build systems that enable people to use data? And one motivation behind that was, is in the word participatory, and that draws on the notion of participatory design, which has a 40 plus year history of, of empowering people and was originally sort of developed in the context of, of the workplace and democratizing the workplace. And, and that tradition of empowerment and mutual learning sort of is something we've tried to to transport and apply to this notion of, of um, smart city and smart city data. So what you see here is a, a specific prototype that Daniel has built for his, his PhD. And the, the, the really interesting thing here is that we actually see the system and the data being transported in situ into the city. So this is a deployment at Wondering Cooks, uh, where Daniel held a series of interviews with food truck vendors and so he brought this, his system and the data with him to allow people to sort of explore how they could actually apply and use data in, 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 in a real sort of uh, um, real life, uh, sort of in a, in a real world environment. Um, so here's one example of um, a data visualization that Daniel created using his system. And that was based on 
fit right data and looking at the distribution of different cuisines across the city. So if you can see that, you know, you have Italian, you have Turkish, uh, Brazilian, and if you have a number of vendors around you that have very similar food trucks, that might not be a good sort of uh, business strategy. So it was a very simple sort of visualization. Um, and that was driven by the demands or the sort of the, the sort of the interaction with the, uh, with the food truck vendors. Another example here, it's being used around crowding, so understanding where events might happen, whether there's a construction site or, it's okay, is there an issue? Oh, yeah. Uh, sorry, Carrie Ann, if you can hear me, if you could mute your microphone, that would be much appreciated. Okay, all right, I'll carry on. So uh, this example is about crowding. So looking at where, where people actually are. So that, again, it could be construction site, it could be events, uh, it could be other events, um, like sporting events, etc. And so visualizing that and bringing that data to the people who might use it, like the food truck vendors. So that's the publication that we've written about that. So that that's the... Uh, that's the notion of um, participatory data visualization and an applied sort of study into what um, this might might actually look like for uh, for people in the city and how we can build systems that would support that. Okay, Marcus, over to you. Thank you. Um, so as you've seen, I think these three sections can also be easily described as like the past, um, present and the future. Um, where Peter has given you a bit of a backdrop and the contextual setting of the um, digital town square and the um, food truck example that um, Marcus just discussed is actually something that happened more, more recently. What we didn't realize at the time is that this food truck example resonated really, really well with industry. So um, about two years ago, um, as part of... Um, a whole bunch of cost savings, um, QUT thought we'd, it would be a good idea to cancel our membership um, on the committee for Brisbane. And the committee contacted me and said, oh, do you want to be on this smart city task force that we've just created? But um, there is a little caveat um, in that um, QUT is thinking of saving the membership. So maybe you can have a word with you know whoever to um, continue the membership payment from QUT to the committee. And I said, yeah, I'll see what I can do. And so we, we managed to not only con, uh, continue the membership, but also be on this committee, um, which eventually produced this particular policy white paper that is called um, Southeast Queensland, Australia's first data community. So it was a bunch of um, uh, industry representatives, local government representatives, uh, myself um, and others from um, the wider Brisbane community coming together to talk about what um, not just a smart city, but a smart region could, could look like. And as part of these deliberations, I brought in the food truck example that had just happened um, a year earlier. And so the food truck example really informed these first two um, kind of initiatives or proposals of that task force. There's also, and I'll explain uh, number one and two in a, a little bit more detail, the data hub and the SME data and digital literacy program. But as part of this white paper, there's also a proposal around um, further investment in Southeast Queensland in smart infrastructure policy. And that eventually made its way into the recent announcement of the Southeast Queensland city deal, uh, as well as further announcements around the Olympics. Um, there is a proposal and um, a recommendation around creating a data leadership accelerator fund uh, by the Queensland state government, as well as a data leadership commissioner. And so this was presented to the Queensland state government and it's, it's making its way through digital, uh, the, the various digital um, advisors to um, chief of staff and ministers and the way it kind of goes. Now, this also dovetailed really nicely with a industry-led initiative, which is been um, shepherded by the Smart Cities Council Australia New Zealand, and they call this initiative the Centre for Data Leadership. Um, we feel it's um, um, really an interesting initiative that comes from industry, probably also slightly informed by some of these debacles that happen internationally, such as the one that Peter mentioned earlier, the um, um, not just termination of the um, sidewalk labs, um, waterfront development in Toronto, but also a lot of the media backlash, the community resistance, as well as 
um, additional resistance from the city of Toronto with regards to concerns around um, sovereignty and data sovereignty. So I think industry are starting to slowly realize that there are these concerns and also that some of these concerns cannot just be easily um, remedied by just talking about security. At the moment, there is this kind of passe too that is about cybersecurity. Whatever your concern is in the IT world, the answer from industry seems to often be, will just increase, you know, the encryption. Now, this particular initiative we felt is interesting because it talks about these, um, what is it, five uh, vitals, um, data leadership vitals of purpose, privacy, security, ethics, and, and governance. Um, as a starting point for the discussion. And so as part of this task force, we said, well, what does it actually mean? What are you going to do in each of these vitals? And I said, oh, we don't really know. Like, why don't we work it out? And so um, the reason why this was useful is because it actually enabled our research to really nicely um, connect and interface with what industry was interested in. We also had some support from, and still interest from Frontier SI, that's the um, new name for a CRC that has come to the end of their Commonwealth funding period. It's just the former uh, CRC for spatial information. Uh, QUT is still a member of Frontier SI and they actually also um, helped um, bring this proposal um, further together. So the vision here is um, for a um, entity to be created through an R&D project that is going to become Brisbane's dedicated facility as well as engagement program to champion data leadership and empower citizens, communities and businesses to participate in city analytics. So in essence, what we've demonstrated as a proof of concept with the um, food truck example, we wanted to be able to replicate this for other um, industries, for other um, data analytics purposes, for other kinds of sole traders and small and medium enterprises and for community groups. So data care has these two components. Um, it is a physical space. You can think of it maybe as a living lab that is actually physically set up um, in a um, dedicated location. It could also be set up in a redeployable mobile kind of fashion. And um, I'm looking at Michael because we had some examples and some experience setting up a mobile maker space a couple of years ago in Townsville, um, repurposing a um, disused shipping container. And so we actually brought some of these images from a couple of years ago from Townsville into the task force discussions and showed them what it can look like and the fact that we worked together with JCU um, to turn a shipping container into a mobile maker um, space. And they were very um, uh, interested in replicating this not as a maker space, but a data living lab. The um, engagement part then comes about the research informing how the space gets configured and activated and used. And so together with ThoughtWorks at the time, we developed a number of scenarios. Um, I'm gonna briefly discuss um, the, um, the last um, two. Uh, just briefly, data awareness is really about um, what the name suggests. So it's actually um, running classes, running engagement workshops that uh, sensitizes um, participants around the issues to do with um, data and, and data governance. Similarly, then, um, if participants feel that they would need further training, there's, you know, um, conventional training workshops being offered. What I think is more interesting is the configurations of the data care living lab um, that are in the um, data action and data futures category. So data action um, would enable um, citizens pretty much to, to lease or rent out or book that space and configure it um, in a similar way to what we've done with the food truck example to suit their particular needs and purposes. So the um, specific um, use case that we've exercised through was around a cycling action group um, that was um, really upset about the prospect of that new um, Neville Bonner bridge across the river um, being connected from South Bank on the one side to the Pokey Hall on the other side of the new casino. And so what would you do as a community action group that is, you know, volunteers, it's uh, a nonprofit, it um, doesn't have a lot of funding, and it's up against um, the might of a um, casino developer that has a lot of money to argue the opposite case, that it's a great idea to connect this bridge to the pokey hole. So the data care facility could enable um, such um, community groups to engage in civic activism, to use data to make their case. The um, data futures one is, I think, also really interesting. Um, it's um, allowing local governments 
to use the space to trial the implications of smart city investment. So for instance, if Brisbane City Council thinks it's a great idea to have um, facial recognition activated in Queen Street Mall, um, as a lot of councillors think it's a great idea, um, they might want to exercise through um, the constellations of data care to kind of see what happens if this um, occurs and what are the implications, as well as what are the kinds of policy and procedural um, um, implications of doing so. And so Data Futures uses a lot of design thinking and design futuring to anticipate um, the consequences of smart city investment. Um, we had quite a bit of interest, um, and I again think that the food truck example and how it was just so illustrative and um, um, appealing to, to industry um, caused a number of these um, um, partners to sign up. So we're currently talking to um, Brisbane's um, waste management contractor, Suez. Um, that's a French company that in Europe is actually heavily invested in these um, intelligent data centers that, that Marcus showed earlier. Um, Brisbane City Council, Frontier, as I mentioned, and Smart Cities Council. Um, but we also got the um, Consumer Policy Research Center on board, which is a Victorian government-funded think tank um, around consumer policy and data um, um, considerations, as well as the um, Queensland government's um, information commissioner and the small business commissioner and Oren at the um, University of Melbourne. And we are again working with Monique Mann at uh, Deakin University. There is a chapter that we managed to publish in this um, edited book that talks about data care in a little bit more detail. It's called From Automation to Autonomy, Technological Sovereignty for Better Data Care in Smart Cities. And that's available on ePrints if you're interested in finding out more about um, the data care um, proposal. And with that, I'll um, thank you and I'm happy to and I think Peter as Marcus as well to, to answer your questions. Thank you. Right, thanks Marcus. So, um, so we have some time now, probably 10 minutes or so for uh, Q&A following that discussion. Um, so I think Tal is monitoring the chat on, um, on Zoom to see if um, anyone wants to ask a question online but um anyone in the room here bernadette you hi this is bernadette speaking um thank you that was really great i loved how you structured the talk um past present and emerging and um can you talk a little bit about how people can get involved i mean i'm i had no idea all this was happening this is great how to how how can people help so the, um, I think um, Peter might want to talk about um, the research group, but um, I might just quickly comment on um, logistically what's currently happening. So we did submit this as a ARC linkage proposal. So it's a written grant that we are currently revising for resubmission because unfortunately it wasn't successful uh, in the last round. So we're currently looking at whether we're going to put it back into the uh, upcoming round that closes in August. Um, our main concern really is that the um, feedback we had from the peer reviewers um, was very positive and so we don't really have much to go by why it was rejected. Um, and the other um, problem is that there's still the legacy from the previous um, government that 70% of funding in the linkage run is going to be allocated to manufacturing priorities. So we're not really sure whether um, this particular proposal would fly under those circumstances where we then fight over the remaining 30%. Um, so one of the things that we're currently discussing with Frontier as I is whether we might look at whether a CRCP, which is a CRC project, um, could be more suitable for um, um, applying for funding. Um, the problem there is that with the new government coming in, the um, scheme hasn't really opened yet or the priorities haven't been set. But logistically, that's kind of where that specific project is at. But in terms of involvement, Peter, do you want to comment on um, just the group and how to get involved? Yeah, for sure. Um, we've got a we've we've got a, a group that's largely formed around some of this collaborative work that we've done. But we're absolutely very interested in expanding that group. Um, and um, so so do get in contact if if you're interested in getting involved. Um, if there are so our, our focus is is quite spatial. Uh, so often a focus on smart cities, uh, but also uh, notions of digital geographies more generally. Um, as well. So if you've got a spatial component to the work you're doing, please 
please get in touch and we'd love to um yeah we'd love to talk more hi thanks guys um yeah so this is maybe like a quite naive question but i just wanted to return to some of peter's stuff so she was talking about how historically like the internet was meant to usher in this new public sphere, this new vision of democracy. And of course that didn't happen. In fact, it did damage to the public sphere. So I guess I'm just wondering like what, do you think that this smart city stuff is going to lead to something new and different? Like, I guess I'm just trying to reconcile what Peter was talking about historically and this future stuff. Like you seem to think there's a lot of promise in the data city stuff. And I'm yeah. just wondering, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, I'm, I might jump in. So I think um, what we're trying to do is tread a balance between these kinds of very dystopian uh, visions of what the smart city is going to be uh, doing, like this complete um, surveillance state and just mining us for our data and these sorts of things, uh, and and seeing it as a liberatory kind of um, vision of, of the city as well, and and seeing some seeing um, potential to engage engage citizens in using their data. So uh, so in that paper I mentioned um, that was led by Monique Mann, uh, which looked at the block sidewalk, um, the sidewalk labs um, project. We the, the other case study we looked at was Barcelona, uh, which had a very much a citizen-led um, approach to their smart city, which was framed around uh, data and technological sovereignty. So this idea that the citizens, um, uh, to boil it down, ha have, a, have a right to their data and um, have sovereignty over their data and had a much more engaged role in um, building that kind of um, smart city approach there. So it's taking those kinds of elements and the participatory elements of that and saying what can we do to engage people more with their data um, within a, 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 an environment in, in an urban environment in that is um, inc increasingly predicated on mining on 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 mining data on citizen data if that makes a bit of sense i'm happy to maybe just give another yeah, jump on in marcus of that answer so my impression from those uh, from the task force meetings and the industry kind of deliberations is that there is a growing um, awareness that they can't just um, go on the way um, they have been, uh, kind of business as usual. Um, the, the term social license to operate, which comes from uh, natural resource mining, has entered the discourse of the smart city industry circus. So even their own industry events, there's dedicated sessions where they talk about how do we maintain social license to operate. Um, and a lot of the discussions are still kind of struggling to overcome the divide, this kind of black and white dichotomy between the smart city hype, and this is amazing, and data is the new gold, and then the dystopian um, kind of big critiques. So Jean, in her new book, um, you know, has a bit of a critique of the big critiques in there, which I think is really useful to actually um, look for middle ground. So how do you work with these kinds of initiatives that are obviously ongoing and and quite advanced in many cities, including this one? Um, and how do you influence the conversations with industry? So in this particular case, we were managed to actually get them genuinely on board to realize that there's more um, participatory and accessible notion of data analytics could actually provide a lot of benefits to, to community groups, to small and medium enterprises, whilst it's not exactly you know, verbatim the same as the digital town square perhaps, it still has a whole bunch of characteristics that we find are really desirable. Yeah, um, so I guess my question then, it's uh, sorry, it's Dan uh, Angus here for those in, who can't see me on Zoom. Um, my question relates to something which I'm uh, getting a little bit passionate about at the moment, which is that with the Olympics coming to Brisbane in 2032, my children's primary school is is kind of up in the air, its future, right? So Anastasia Palaszczuk announced that the Gabba was going to be the, the centerpiece of the Olympics before the bid, you know, even came and, and without anyone else really kind of knowing that that was going to be a thing. And this tiny school that's been there for about 123 years um, is now its future is in the air, right? With something like that, it seems that 
there is a complete continuing lack of transparency around any data involved in planning that, any data in terms of future enrollment um, projections, data coming out of the, the Department of Education, data coming from the you know, Premier and Cabinet where these decisions have been made. I mean, they've been based on something. We hear numbers of $1 billion for reconstruction of this that it's going to fit in with this Olympic new norm. My question is, cynically, I sit here and, and hear these these promises around smart cities and data and such, but that politically we're still in an environment where the powers that be want none of that data actually in the hands of its citizenry. They, they, they're using these tools and these levers to, to gobble up more of it and, and, can, and keep it in their own hands. I mean, have I got a right to be cynical or is there is there a... Is it like, how do we functionally, I guess is what I'm asking, how do we functionally actually use these tools, grab the levers, put them in the hands of the community and, and you know, in a way that they will work and that the powers that be have no choice but to start playing fair? I'm happy to, to um, maybe just jump in and, and try, you know, give, give a bit of an answer. It's not really a um, um, comprehensive one though. I think though, that Brisbane has just elected three Greens MPs, and it's it's partly due to a lot of people trying to make sense of um, very local issues that they're grappling with. So the one I'm most familiar with, as as you know, Dan, is the um, the flight path noise. And what I've noticed in, in that group is just the um, the sheer um, um, enthusiasm for really um, going out of their way to access data, all sorts of data, it, from conventional data in the sense of um, submitting FOI requests to various departments and getting you know, historic documents around approvals and the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Act's um, public register and going through you know, the entire history of that. Um, to citizen science projects around um, noise recordings and the list goes on. And so um, it enabled the community collectively to realize that something was going on here. It's really, really fishy. The, and the fishiness in a way fueled the anger and the anger fueled the complaints and the complaints fueled um, pressure on politicians to the extent that it reached the deputy prime minister and um, the setup and one of our colleagues, um, Doug Baker is on it, of a forum that is reviewing the flight paths at the moment, as well as a lot of protest vote that has toppled three um, sitting um, MPs. So whilst that is, you know, a very recent and maybe insular example, data played such a um, tremendous role in people making sense of what they were experiencing. And I think previously, when this happened um, in the early 2000s, Kevin Rudd, when he was a backbench or a candidate, he also fought the airport on these issues. These kinds of tools and that level of um, internet not just the, the access to the data, but also the way that the internet um, facilitated people talking about it and finding each other and, and forming this group so quickly. So we know from insiders that the airport's um, executives have just been completely flabbergasted by underestimating these retirees with Facebook skills. They did not see this coming to the extent that um, they are now facing a curfew in Brisbane. If if I could just um, jump in, Dan, it's interesting that you mentioned the Olympics because there is a Southeast Queensland digital twin project and the entire kind of uh, thing driving that forward is the Olympics. Uh, so using um, using uh, the Olympics as a way of doing things like um, simulating mass transit uh, uh, in, in order to prepare for the Olympics um, and doing these kinds of simulation models. So it's almost certain that that data will be out there. And um, yeah, so I, I, I don't think you're wrong to be cynical, but as Marcus has already said, um, governments and industry are becoming increasingly aware uh, of how critical our citizen trust is to get projects off the ground uh and and the so so i i think that that um is becoming a bit more of a nuanced conversation around that i think with government and industry and if i might just add to that um so i think i think um sort of data activism is you know what you're talking about really in terms of uh in terms of the airport and uh one of the challenges there is not just literacy but also the ability to use the the tools that allow you to make sense of data and that you know those are i think research questions that we're trying to answer sort of actually doing on the ground participatory design with people to understand what sort of do they actually need how could they sort of 
uh, enlist those data. And we've got a PhD student who's currently in, uh, sort of in, uh, in uh, Mount Tambourine working with the Women's Association counting road users, like the number of cars going across the road, so to, to, to really sort of understand what is on the ground data people are dealing with. So it doesn't help you with the, uh, with the, with the school, but I think that sort of level of uh, sort of actually supporting data activism in a way um, is also important. Okay, I think we'd better um, bring that part of the um, presentation today to a close, but uh, please join me in thanking Marcus, Marcus and Peter uh, for that fantastic presentation. Um, and Amy, maybe um, if you just organise sharing your screen again there. Um, I've got a feeling that um, we're going to be talking about the Olympics a lot uh, in the coming years. Um, it's, it's going to come to dominate um, all discussion, I think, for probably, well, better or worse, but yeah. Um, so I hope we don't become the Digital Media Research Centre for the Olympics. Um, <laughs> yeah, maybe, yes, Axel just said maybe there's money to, to be had there. No, yeah, that, that, that would be good. Um, all right, so I'm going to hand over now to Amy Horrigan, who's a PhD student in the Digital Media Research Centre. And um, her presentation, um, it, it takes a bit of a different uh, focus on this question of the digital town square, but um, an incredibly important one. Um, so over to you, Amy. So, talofa, everyone. Um, thank you for coming along today. I hope that you are all doing fabulously. Um, I also want to begin by just acknowledging that we're gathering on the unceded lands of the Turrbal and Yagara peoples. I pay my respects to their elders, laws, customs, and creation spirits, and also honor the powerful presence of the lands and waters around us as that which inspires and incites teaching, learning, and research. So, as Michael said, I'm Amy. I'm a third year PhD candidate in the DMRC. Um, and today I'm gonna to talk through some of these tensions within this idea of a digital town square um, as it relates to and extends from a far asa more grounded perspective of digital inclusion um, and the use of digital technologies for community engagement and individual empowerment. Um, so basically I'm gonna talk about how the values and practices of Samoan culture um, challenge and are challenged by socio-technical constructs like the digital town square. Um, in putting my presentation together today, um, I've drawn from work that I've been doing for the past year with two Pacifica community organizations based here in Mianjin, Brisbane. Um, and in that project, we've sought to um, look at how digital inclusion is more broadly constructed from a Samoan perspective, um, and also how the two organizations can use this emerging faster, more grounded definition um, to drive any future digital inclusion related work that they're going to do. Um, recognizing my position as someone who is not Samoan, and also some of the broader decolonial objectives that are necessary for this type of research, um, the group have really taken the lead on designing the project's um, objectives, actions, and anticipated outcomes. Um, and we've ultimately come to work alongside each other as peer researchers. So in saying all of that, as a first step, I just wanna emphasize that I'm not seeking to make claims for the Samoan community or to speak on their behalf in my presentation today. Um, rather, I aim to um, position this work as an ongoing provocation for my own praxis and for digital inclusion research and industry practice more broadly. Um, to kick things off and to help situate some of the points that I'm gonna to make today, um, I just wanna give a quick introduction to Samoa's socio-political structure. So everyday life in Samoa is underpinned by Fa'a Samoa or the Samoan way. At the heart of Fa'a Samoa are considerations of the Va, the contextual multidimensional socio-spatial relationality that guides knowledge and action. Um, to put a different way, the Va is the space that relates. Uh, it holds separate entities and things together and provides context and meaning to these relationships. Through the VAR, notions of identity and subjectivity are mediated by perceptions of the self as individual. So as an identity that is deeply dependent on others and which determines certain relational obligations, responsibilities, and behaviors. The VAR also extends into the Fa Matai, Samoa's traditional decentralized governance structure. 
The Farmatai implements social and economic order through a hierarchical political structure that gives decision-making power and authority to Matai or village chief and other Faipule village leaders through the genealogical status and associated land titles of their Ainga Potopoto or extended family. Individuals are again ascribed certain roles, responsibilities, and importantly, social boundaries based on their position within Fa'amatai. Fulfilling these roles and remaining respectful of those social boundaries ensures harmony and political stability within the village and indeed within Samoan society overall, because even though each village ends up with its own level of political autonomy, the emphasis remains on kinship ties and underlying principles like reciprocity, consensus and respect. Since 1962, though, when Samoa regained its independence from New Zealand, a form of parliamentary democracy has been adopted alongside Matai, with village leaders holding some sway at the local level, but otherwise being subsumed within kind of a larger structure or system of democratic governance. Um, and it's perhaps the competing ideals of these dual approaches to governance that start to introduce tensions in the way that open political discussions and decision-making opportunities um, lead to the empowerment and inclusion of certain subsets of the Samoan population. So as a first kind of provocation, take the individual, for example. As I just mentioned, ideas of the self in Samoa are broadly conceptualized and enacted through processes of being for the collective. Um, and although this idea of a kind of sociocentric Samoan identity might be more myth than reality, it does nonetheless continue to drive Samoan individuals' interactions and behaviors both on and offline. Um, in fact, individuals who deviate from this kind of ontological premise of how Samoans should be are often called out for behaving in a manner unbecoming of a Samoan. Um, the group I collabor collaborated with were undeniably Samoan, um, and each of them positioned themselves subjectively in all discussions as Samoan. But because they felt they lacked certain cultural capital, like some of the relational knowledge um, that emerges from being connected to particular spaces and places, there remained this inherent perception that there was a degree of subjective separation between them and real Samoans. Um, but to try and move towards overcoming these barriers within the construction of their Samoan identities, the group shared about how they turned to digital technologies. Um, because of the increase in transnational migration of the Samoan population, many digital spaces, but mainly things like social media, have really quickly become positioned as sites in which presentations of the ideal Samoan self are embedded into envisioned and actual outcomes of use, like performing those all important relational practices. Um, and one of the group members spoke about how she uses Facebook to communicate with some of the older women in her family as a way of strengthening her family um, network, maintaining those crucial cultural responsibilities and ties to Samoan village life, um, and then through that, retaining and building her social positionality and personal identity as a Samoan. So when thinking about how to engage in a digital town square, and I'm just going to build off Peter's definition, <laughs> um, a Samoan individual has to negotiate or try to seek a balance between how much they get involved in a conversation as an individual and possibilities for this conversation to further remove or diminish their capacity to be a Samoan as a individual. Without doing so, without being respectful of seeking that balance, they might directly violate those relational practices which make the Samoan individual individual who they are. So you can perhaps start to see how in the reflections that the group made, um, ideas of unconstrained individual expression, like those put forth by Musk, within an open digital space might not be conducive to the construction and maintenance of the Samoan identity. To introduce another complication, how do you construct yourself in relation to the collective when the collective itself keeps changing or when the people who get to determine how the collective is perceived and functions are perhaps preoccupied by their own changing socio-political objectives to help unpack this um, i want to talk about the recent 2021 Gen uh, samoan general election which some of you might be uh, know a little bit about but otherwise um, some quick facts Prior to the election, the Human Rights Protection Party had been in power for about 40 years, um, almost continuously since 1982. 
The political stability of the party was weakened somewhat in 2020 following a suite of laws that they proposed to strengthen the authority of the Land and Titles Court um, and their capacity to have supreme control over issues relating to Samoan customs like land rights and chiefly titles. A series of recounts based on um, suspected corruption, counting errors, and also the parliamentary gender quota introduced by the Human Rights Party in 2013 delayed the calling of the election by several months. Um, but in the end, the newly formed Fa Tua Tua I La Tua Samoa Uatasi, or FAST Party, um, was victorious and Samoa's first female prime minister was elected. Um, while all influential factors in the final result of the election, the other really crucial thing that occurred was the use of social media by the FAST party during, the, um, during their electoral campaign. FAST deliberately chose to live stream political discussions in every constituency in Samoa via social media platforms, in most cases, Facebook. As most Samoans living abroad can't vote in Samoan elections, the FAST party explicitly created a way for the extended transnational Samoan community to be present um, and involved in the political discussions as an otherwise excluded political audience. And boy, did they involve themselves. They circulated so much information online. They made digital financial payments to their preferred political candidates in Samoa um, and ultimately really made their political um, voting prefer preferences really clear to their family members in Samoa. Comparatively, while FAST was doing this, the HRPP party kind of kept driving home arguments that increasing foreign influence um, was detrimentally altering long-held cultural customs and practices of governance in Samoa. And actually a year earlier in the lead up to the election, the party had made moves to ban Facebook, directly invoking a sort of cultural protectionist discourse that digital communications like uh, digital communication channels like Facebook um, directly eroded far Samoa values like respect and consensus and therefore threatened the Samoan way of life. So rather than uh, being a debate of each party's kind of specific policies and governance agendas, the 2021 general election really became a debate and reflection on the broader socio-centric ideals underneath Samoan culture and Samoan identity. So on one hand, you had the arguments that opportunities to freely discuss and access political information online, to have your voice and opinions heard, directly contradicted those customary practices inherent to Far Samoa and to the Far Matai, um, which does otherwise dictate that you individually contribute to the collective through the prescribed responsibilities afforded to you through your social role and positionality. And in that, not everyone holds an equal position to be able to participate in the decision-making councils um, and political discussions. On the flip side though, um, critiques of these practices or the introduction of new ways of involving people like in a digital town square are necessary to make sure that cultural and political practice does not become the preserve of the powerful like it did in the 2021 election. But again, what does it mean or what effect does it have when the individuals leading these critiques or giving them meaning and value at a larger scale are those within the socio-political elite? All right, it's that perpetual question of are the democratic ideals within the digital public space really democratic? We can extend this argument um, to when thinking about the ongoing coloniality embedded within the construction and regulatory control of digital infrastructure like social media platforms. Um, superficially, digital technologies seek to benefit and empower the global society through greater opportunities for inclusion and expression. But the possibilities for autonomy and freedom afforded by digital technologies are diminished when considering how they are, at least in the case of Samoa, held offshore by foreign providers, governed under foreign laws, and often the only available option in place of more local alternatives. In Samoa, digital infrastructure remains predominantly in the control of the West, um, or at least under the regulatory guardianship of countries like Australia and New Zealand. And although their regulatory policy suggestions um, kind of seek to situate these countries as reliable and trustworthy partners, they're perhaps more evident of the hangover of colonialism 
um, embedded within the ongoing national security interests of these regional leaders. And I think the recent um, dramas around the China Samoa trade deal are a really good example of this because the partnership between Australia and Samoa that ensures the latter's integration into regional and social networks under this kind of banner of regional cohesion and small state empowerment um, does more ex implicitly extend socioeconomic development trends that reinforce the boundedness of Samoa um, and really undermine its um, significance as a sovereign nation in the region. Uh, we can also look at these concerns of coloniality from a material perspective or a socio-material perspective. So for instance, there is no complete translation of the word digital in Samoan. And this is really important to consider because for Samoans, language as experience in and with world is deeply rooted in material, whereby matter does matter as knowing and being in and with world. So put another way, language intersects with the material to open up different modes of relating in and with world in both a human and non-human sense. For the group, the digital was seen to have emerged from the systems of knowledge and material production controlled by Western actors. Um, as an example, they spoke about the internet, which at both an infrastructural and content level, they saw as operating through a Western epistemology that centers Western ontologies, which privilege the English language. Um, and from this, they shared about how difficult it is for Samoans to explore the many possibilities presented by digital technologies like the internet, and even to comprehend the notion of something like the digital town square, when there is no Samoan language or material translation for the concept. So in thinking about the three kind of ideas or points I've put forward today, which to recap were concerns of individual identity expression, changes to local governance practices, and the effects of digital colonialism and globalization in the Pacific region. Um, I've hopefully given you a sense of why there is a need to keep questioning what and whose agendas are encompassed within the social, political, and technical construction of a digital town square. And if I were to emphasize anything from today, I think it would be how, because Samoan ontological approaches guided by Samoan concepts of reality are not incorporated into digital infrastructures, any digital platform that would support the creation of a digital town square would inscribe and institute a distinctly colonial way of being that subversely contradicts someone ways of knowing, doing and becoming. And so I think the only way we're going to really counter this um, or to counter this as we move ahead is that we need to continuously and more consciously consider how social and technological infrastructure reorder social arrangements and mechanisms of knowledge production that further shape who, what, and how we can know. Bafatai, thank you. So, can I nick that one? Yeah, it's really you, sweaty, I'm sorry. No, that's all right. If you grab that other one. Okay. Yeah, just so I can get it spread around. Yep. Okay, so do we, um, <clears throat> thank you, Amy. That was, that was excellent, thank you. And do we have any questions from the room here to begin with, or indeed from anyone online. Okay. Thank you, Amy. That was a brilliant presentation. Ooh. I found it absolutely fascinating and so um, so robust. And, and I particularly appreciate it because I looked at Maori um, data sovereignty and, and um, Maori uh, um, data stewardship for my thesis. So can't wait to talk to you further about it. My question is, yeah. how engaged are the Samoan people that you are working with in uh, data stewardship activities, sovereignty discussions? How much are they informing it, mm. if at all? I don't know. Yeah, so my, my project deviated from its original intentions, where when I first came to start my PhD, I specifically wanted to work with groups based in Samoa who are in that, maybe not necessarily like a data stewardship position, um, but are kind of in a more prominent or take a more prominent role in developing digital infrastructure and digital occlusion agendas in Samoa. Because of the spicy cough, um, I wasn't able to travel to Samoa. Um, and instead I've been working with um, these two community groups who are based here and they're more focused on um, young people and ideas of civic participation and 
um, social inclusion for Samoans here and who have just arrived from Samoa. So while it's not currently on their agendas, they're definitely tapped into multicultural networks um, who are very interested in this kind of topic and who the idea of data sovereignty or what's done with the data of non-Western peoples, um, what that future is going to look like, they're definitely getting more and more interested in that for sure. Okay, another question from the room here, perhaps, or from someone online. Marcus. Um, thanks, Amy. It's really great um, to see these insights and, and to see them also explained so, so well. Um, I, I very much second the, the critique of the um, technological underpinnings that really embed individualism and the individual um, from, you know, social networking and the origins there where you kind of create your, you know, your profile and from there you, you reach out, which is very contrary to how um, not just the Samoan but a whole bunch of First Nations people think in a much more relational, a relational manner. Mm -hmm. Have you come across any examples of um, um, designs or concepts that were then trying to reimagine this to actually create digital platforms or whatever you might want to call them, digital artifacts that are actually um, design created and envisaged um, on the basis of that more relational ethos? Uh, not in this specific project, um, but in um, other work and other connections that I have, definitely. Um, so one of the organizations that I'm connected with or one of the companies I'm connected with in Samoa um, have created an app which is specifically premised off um, those kind of relational practices in the area of agriculture um, and food production and consumption. Um, obviously, you know, the Pacific is a region that's ad in adverse, uh, adversely affected by um, the effects of the climate crisis um, and increased natural disasters. Um, and so this platform um, has kind of, um, I guess more processes built into it so that they're able to keep better track of where resources are being distributed, where food resources are being distributed um, and to engage community groups like um, women in business and female farmers um, and how they can be supported more during those moments of crisis and stuff like that. And that's, again, that's more based on, you know, in the Famatai, for example, there are specific women's committees or women's groups, and that's trying to accommodate um, them and what access they have um, to not only digital resources, but also food resources and monetary resources and things like that as well. Mm. Mm. Great. Any a uh, day? Yes, yes. <laughs> the little subtle like. Oh, <laughs> just if someone else has, I mean, I, I am one of Amy's supervisors, so I, I don't want to steal the floor. Um, Amy, there's there's something that stood out to me today that um, I don't think's come up in any of our meetings we've had and talked about at length. Oh, sorry. Is around no, 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 no. But it's it's I think it is an aside that that the political uh, contest, right? This that happened, mm -hmm. um, and the use of essentially social media for organizing um, and mobilizing, mm -hmm. and that idea of reaching out to those um, communities that are that are kind of um, expat communities or, or like um, currently not located in Samoa mm. is really interesting and reflecting also on the work we've done recently with the federal election that again I'm reminded that parties, political parties that seem to try and use social media for broadcast purposes to kind of here is our policy and vote for us and we're just going to use it for promotion tend to do quite poorly at it, whereas those that use it to mobilize and to encourage civic participation, to, to leverage and, 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 and gather the voice of the public and, and give them platforms seem to do very well, right? Mm -hmm. And just wondering if you want to reflect on that, like, is that similar to the experience in Samoa that it was you know, quite a canny strategy to rather than try and use social media just to, hey, look, here's our party and here's our policies and then, you know, go vote for us rather to try and go, hey, look, you know, we're going to give you a window in here and we're going to facilitate your participation in the political process yeah. in, in quite a neutral way in some ways. Yeah. Oh, it was 100% like a super strategic decision made by um, Prime Minister Fiamme. Um especially because in like I said in the year prior the rhetoric or like public discourse around a platform like Facebook had been no shut it down ban it get rid of it it's not conducive to our way of life 
Um, and then, you know, Biame kind of came in and was like, no, 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 we can use this in a way that's, um, that is Samoan because it's engaging your family. It's engaging the Samoan community. They just happen to live overseas. Um, and I think the other, the other aspect, which I didn't really talk about in the presentation, cause it's its whole own arm of things, um, is the role of churches and religion in Samoa as well. And how, um, a lot of the kind of, um, uh, validity maybe of using something like social media was also broadly bracketed by the churches and the views that the churches had and stuff like that as well. But yeah, that's it's that's a whole other <laughs> but Yeah. Hmm. Any other questions from the room? Or, or I'll ask one. No. Okay. Oh, uh, any from online? No. Um, so as both. Um, um, I guess chair of the session and also as one of your supervisors. Um, <laughs> I'll, ask, I'll ask for a privileged position. Um, so uh, one of the things that occurs to me, you know, just generally as we've been talking today about um, the notion of the digital town square, um, and, and it won't be surprising to any of you that I would ask a question about digital inclusion and your projects about digital inclusion. Um, but, you know, if, I mean, one of the things that challenges the notion of it town square is is the idea that not everyone's included obviously and uh, you know that's i guess going back to the agora as peter was talking about at the beginning of the session certainly not everyone was included there mm -hmm. and um and i think today we have a you know um at present at least we continue to have a situation where not everyone's included in whatever a digital town square might look like or, or be um, and it was really, uh, so it's really interesting in your work, Amy, that um, not only, well, um, by implication of Samoans not having a, a word for digital, mm. they certainly didn't have a, a, um, a, a word for digital inclusion. Mm. Um, so I, and, and you know, that was kind of challenging for you as part of your methodology to begin with. How do you have a discussion about digital inclusion mm. in that kind of context? So I wondered if you might talk about that just a little bit more, um, both in terms of, you know, reflecting on what that meant for you having that discussion, mm. but also just in terms of this broader implication for the notion of a digital town square. Yeah, so, um... For me, the project's been really great. So I guess uh, step, uh, to take a step back, I came to the PhD from industry. So I've worked in an, uh, as a kind of in international development communication consultant and things like digital inclusion were very definitionally very drilled into me. And so for me, the project's been a lot of unlearning, which I think has been one of the best things and also using that as a way to kind of go, well, yeah, what is inclusive about digital inclusion? And one of the really helpful ways of getting to that point of being able to question what is inclusive um, is to have had the project be led by the group quite a bit. Um, you know, uh, one of, I guess, the key methods that I use throughout my project has been um, a process called Talanoa, which is where you're in that more relationally responsive um, kind of knowledge sharing context and over the course of the project to kind of get to a resolution where you know we haven't put a singular definition on digital inclusion but we've been able to come up with some principles that resonate with the group that's really occurred through that multi-stage Talanoa process like I said I've been you know working with this group for a year and it has been working with that group for a year um, we did three main workshops but then aside from that there's been you know multiple conversations and um, kind of having them share little things with me, little concerns, little hopes and desires for the future. Um, and now it's really great where we're at the point where we've constructed those principles together. Um, and now they're able to go to the other community groups and stuff that they're working with it. So it's, it's really great that it's, again, not this one singular definition of digital inclusion or standard of de digital inclusion. It's this constantly evolving, growing, ever-changing, fluid definition that is maybe more relationally responsive or um, does recognize maybe more of that contextual differences um, that really need to be more encompassed within the inclusive practices we want to do in digital inclusion. 
yeah cool brilliant thanks amy all right thank you okay so um so that's really it for our session today. Thank you all for coming along and, and being part of this. And as I said, we've got a number of other um, DMRC events coming up in the coming months that we all hope that you'll get along to. And um, otherwise, uh, thank you all for coming and we'll see you next time.